So the title of the message today is, is A Pattern of Peace. And one of my favorite, possibly my all-time favorite scripture in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of good ones, right? Uh, but <laughs> one of my all-time personal favorite ones, I know there's some scriptures that we can just really connect with and identify with. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. We all want that. Amen? His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray and ask the Lord to really renew our minds as we open his word this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how real you make it in our lives how you reach out to us just as we are, but you don't leave us that way. You've got great plans for your people, for us to be uh, walking in love and, and united and just united around you, Jesus. And, and so we pray that you would uh, bless all of your people this morning as we open your word, that you would just give us understanding. You say that if we lack understanding for ask, to ask for it and you're faithful to give it, so we just open our hearts this morning. We let our guard down with you and ask and invite you in um, to encourage us wherever we need encouragement, to challenge us where we need to be challenged, to help us to grow. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So a pattern of peace. So it's kind of crazy. Um, the Word of God always agrees. you know. So no matter what message we're preaching in the house, like we're seeking the Lord for what he wants to say, and, and we're, we're speaking from the Bible, you know, and there's agreement there. But isn't it cool sometimes how there's almost like this syncing up that happens where multiple different people are speaking and not, none of them know what the other person is going to be speaking about, and yet somehow that just syncs up. You know, in different ways hap that happens in our lives. But it's really cool because as I was... Um, feeling the Lord really impressed this message upon my heart. I had no idea what Pastor Scott was going to preach on last weekend, and he preached all about uh, being on guard against division in the church, against bitterness, and a lot about forgiveness. So then, in the same breath, this message is going to be a lot about asking for forgiveness, which is really cool, I thought, as well as um, charity. A couple of the songs that, that she and the team picked for this weekend we're on the same tone of reconciliation. They'll know we're Christians by our love. Uh, as well as True Troopers, I hear, they had a similar message. And none of us synced up on that intentionally. Like, it was just really cool. And I feel like maybe, you know, I, I think about the fact that in the scriptures, there's times where there's like, indeed, I say so, or there's a repeat. And you're like, what, is that like an error? Like, is that a typo? You know, did the scribes just kind of like start falling asleep and forgot that they already wrote that line? There's a reason it's there. It's to draw our attention. It's to say, pay extra close attention to this. And I feel like God is really trying to get our attention in this season with something. So let's jump right in. Hebrews 12, 14 says to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And Romans 12, 18 through 19 says, if possible, here's a really important line, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, here's a tough one, never avenge yourselves. Some of us really need to hear that this morning. Never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay says the Lord. Why do you think that is? I think the Lord knows best how to dole out. He's the only one who knows how to dole out judgment on others. We don't have the capability. We mess it all up. I mess it all up when I try to get my mitts on it and do what I think is best. So what I'd like to do with this mess is essentially kind of reweave three threads of Christian living, of Christ-like peacemaking and peacekeeping that I believe have come unraveled, that have come undone in our me-first culture. I think there's a lot of people in the room that, if I say that term, can really relate to that that's what's happening right now, even if you haven't thought about it a lot. Me first. And really, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. That's the way that it's really always been ever since Adam and Eve in the garden. 
me first. That's what it was all about. I know best. I know better than God. But especially now in social media culture, social networking, it's just so much easier to just fire off things. And I won't go down that road because we simply don't have time and I'll probably get myself in trouble. Thread one, bite your tongue. Might get in trouble for that one. Bite your tongue. Proverbs 10, 19 says this, and this is pretty powerful. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. This is a big one. This is going to challenge us a little bit. Matthew 5, 21 through 22 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. <clears throat> whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, What's happening here, if you look at the original context and language behind these two words, insult and you fool, essentially if you boil it down, what it means is that you're counting someone as so stupid, so foolish, so worthless that they don't have the right to life. That's the context of this, is that you're actually murdering someone in your heart. Now as I say that, there may be some political figures that some of us think of, that we need to come to the Lord and say, forgive me for murdering that person in my heart. Let me just tell you that that does not belong in the household of God. That kind of attitude does not belong in our hearts. No matter how justified we think we are in our condemnation of someone else, we aren't justified. So come to the Lord and, re and repent of that because let me just tell you, with no holds barred, that's not of God, that's of the devil. And it doesn't belong in the household of God. Here's a good one. 1 John 4.20 Whoever claims to love God and hates his brother is a liar. Harsh. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense when you put it that way. Don't you love the word? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, thread two, search yourself. Because we all know we're not perfect and there are times when you forgot to bite your tongue. When you said something, when you did something. So then what do you do when you recognize that? So you want to search yourself. You want to examine yourself. You want to invite the Lord, as King David did. Search my heart, O God. Any crooked way in me, any way that doesn't align with your heart, make it right. So we're going to look at two different aspects of a section of Scripture from Matthew chapter 5. And that's kind of the fulcrum upon which this whole message is placed. So let's read that, 523 through 24 in Matthew. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, or in other words, that you're in conflict with them in any way, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come off of your gift. What's ultimately being said here is to not let this moment of realization just pass you by. Not to just brush it under the rug, not to minimize it and, and instantly assume that you're right and they're wrong. That you had no part to play in the wronging. Is that a word? Wronging? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. I like it. Really ask the Lord to show you in that moment. Is there something that I didn't get right? Is there some way that I need to go uh, and there's a good chance you actually already know that. Uh, you don't even have to ask that he's already brought it to your mind in that moment. There is something specific for you to go and make amends with your brother or sister. In that case, you just got to go and make things right. Let me tell you from personal experience, and I'm not that old, but I have experienced a little bit in my life. 
my short years on earth, and that is that the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Especially, most especially when you're dealing with other human beings. All right, thread three, and we're going to spend most of our time here. Go the distance. So the same verse, we're just going to highlight a couple different things. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come offer your gift. What this does is it gives us a sense that uh, really it says that God has, wants us to have a sense of urgency and priority in our peacemaking and peacekeeping. That this needs to be so important that we're actually quick to go and do it. Kind of like a Band-Aid. There's a time to take the Band-Aid off and no amount of waiting is gonna help. You just rip that thing off, the air gets, the H2O, H2O gets to your, wait, H2O, that's oxygen, right? That's water. <laughs> I know the words. Uh, <laughs> oh, two gets to your wound, and it can. Oh, uh, moving on. <laughs> Good times. Um, it gives us a sense of urgency to be quick about it. There is uh, many of you will know who have been in church or have uh, been in the Bible for any length of time, be familiar with the story of King David. Some of you won't. Um, some of us just need a reminder of some of those details. So I'm going to, the best I can, I'm going to give you a summary of the highlights of King David. So basically he's called by God to be king. And then he has to wait a really long time to actually become king because King Saul is king. And king Saul, he's not the greatest guy. He actually tries to kill David a lot of times, uh, in short. Chases him down, persecutes him. Um, and even though, and, and, and also important to note that David is like best buddies with uh, Jonathan, which is King Saul's son. And in all of that, I, I don't seem to find, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong after this message, <laughs> come up to me and let me know, but I don't seem to find anywhere that Saul was actually truly repentant for what he did uh, to King David. And yet, throughout his life, throughout all this time, this being chased down, and even opportunities to kill King Saul when he slept in his tent, David didn't lift a finger. And his men, he, he exhorted them not to celebrate. He actually got mad um, and executed judgment on some of his servants who uh, kind of were rejoicing over the fact that Jonathan and King Saul were dead after they had been killed. So he went the extra mile. He went the distance with peacekeeping and peacemaking, holding that peace even preemptively. And we see that really vividly in this uh, account that I want to read to you that I just, it just strikes me as very interesting. It's one of those little sections of scripture that really stands out to me. So in 2 Samuel, we're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 9 together. It's not that lengthy. David's kindness to Mephibosheth. Now, for the sake of not getting tongue-tied uh, from here on out, I'm going to try to call him Phoebe. Everybody good with that? And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So at this point, Saul and Jonathan are already dead. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Yes, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He's in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then the king sent and brought him from this place. And Phibi, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Phibi. And he answered, 
Behold, I am your servant. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Phibi, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Phibi ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Phibi had a young son whose name was Micah. And Phibi lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. What a powerful story of kindness, forbearance, of going the distance with peacekeeping. Again, it's almost as if David lived in such a way, uh, and there's parts of the Bible that say he was a man after God's own heart. Despite his monumentous blundering sins that he repented of, um, he was a man after God's own heart. And I think this is one of the, the ways that he synced up with God's heart, that he was so passionate about keeping the peace that he actually did it preemptively. When he didn't have any requirement, there was no need for him to go and reconcile with Mephibosheth. He hadn't wronged him in any way. And yet, he almost did it preemptively because he, he went and he continued to show honor to the house of Saul. He even recognizes that it's the house of King Saul. After all this wrongdoing he experienced from Saul, I mean, that just blows my mind. I don't think I would handle the situation the same way. I mean, I believe that God's grace can uh, do anything, but uh, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in myself for that kind of patience and long-suffering and extending of mercy. But it's just a, isn't that a beautiful story? When I was preparing for this message, I was trying to find some stories, as I often do, and so I googled stories about apologizing, and it was really interesting what I found. I kind of didn't find what I was looking for, and yet I did much faster than I thought I was going to, just not in the way I expected. Because the first several pages, and I didn't get past like the first two or three pages, were all how to teach children to apologize. And I thought about it, and I was like, oh, that's kind of odd, but then I thought, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. Because isn't there something so simple about reconciliation? Something so pure. We just, as adults, we really get it complicated. We really do. And isn't that the way of the kingdom? As Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3 through 4, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Want to be the greatest? Jesus says, take the lowliest position. And then don't flaunt that position because then you kind of just nixed your whole jewel in your crown you were going to get for that one. I remember a few years back, uh, there was this commercial that kind of um, draw attention, drew attention to what it's like in Canada and how it's like, a, some people call it a den of politeness. And I don't know, it was like a TELUS or a Rogers commercial or something. And there was this part where these geese were flying, these Canadian geese. We just call them geese, right? I'm from the States, so forgive me. <laughs> Down there, we call them Canadian geese. So these geese are flying, and they're honking at each other. But instead of just honking, they're saying, sorry, 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 sorry. I don't know. It cracked me up. I thought it was funny. It had to be there. That's, who's seen it? Who's seen that commercial? We got a couple takers. <laughs> And those that aren't willing to admit it. 
And I heard a comedian once say that Canada is the only place where you can be in a, like a restaurant, like going through a door or something or in a crowd, and you bump into somebody else and they say, oh, sorry about that. I apologize for my horrible Eastern Canada accent that I'm trying to do. So we say sorry a lot, don't we? What's he going to say next? How often do we really mean it? How often do we really think about what that word means? Just like the word love has just been adulterated in our culture, so is the word sorry. We just rattle it off, throw it out like candy, until it doesn't mean anything anymore. I say, as Christians, let's claim it back. Let's stand upon the true meaning of those words. Amen? Love and saying sorry. To be truly apologetic about some way that you've hurt another is to say sorry no matter what the response is. A true apology does not require reciprocation. It's, I'm sorry, period. That's so important. And I'm challenged by that constantly. When you go to somebody to say sorry, put a nice period at the end and expect nothing else. And it's beautiful how when you go with that kind of sincerity, a lot of times the beauty of reconciliation takes place and it's mutual. And that person, because you came sincerely and apologized, and they can tell by your body language, by your eyes, there's something in the eyes, isn't there? That you're sincere and that you expect nothing from them, that then they are prompted in kindness to you to say, you know what? I was wrong too. I'm, I'm, so, I'm also sorry. And there's just something amazing that happens there. And we grow, don't we? We begin to bear fruit that we couldn't bear any other way through that reconciliation. There's this just amazing, I think, beautiful poetic line from a, one of the artists that I listened to, a singer-songwriter named Gregory Allen Isakov. And this line has just really stuck with me through the years. In my marriage, uh, whenever I say I love you to Megan, I am challenged by this every time. I'd never say I love you just to hear you say it back. Isn't that beautiful? And convicting. Same thing applies to saying sorry. I'd never say I'm sorry just to hear you say it back. Because what is that? That's, that's selfish. Ultimately, it's selfish. That's going to someone simply saying something to them and it's just lip service just so you can get the feel goods. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know, in the, in the moment when you realize, you know, there's something still there, there's a conflict going on, and you're just trudging on doing your thing, and you think, oh, you know, I'll just wait until that person comes to me. If it's a big enough deal, they'll come to me. Now, they haven't brought it up yet, so it's, you know, it's probably fine. I've heard it said, the one who knows goes. Whether that's the person who's been wronged, or the person who's done the wronging. On the flip side of the coin, please know, I want to remind you, this comes from both a place of love and personal experience of trial and error. And remember that amazing verse in Proverbs that says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. With that in mind, the flip side of the coin, if you're someone who's easily offended all the time, and constantly feel others need to apologize to you, you might need to loosen up a little and realize that your peace of mind is not the responsibility of others. Ooh. That, again, is coming from a place of personal trial and error. Some of us are waiting for an apology from people we need to apologize to. If you played any part, it doesn't matter that he said, she said, oh, you don't know what happened, you don't know the whole story. It doesn't matter. 
if you played a part in any way in wronging someone else, could be what you said, could be the way you said it. I've heard a preacher say before, you can be 100% right and 100% wrong at the top of your voice all at the same time. The ends do not justify the means. Just because what you said was right, I almost think sometimes that someone who says the right things all the time but treats others harshly is further away from God than the person who says the incorrect things but has compassion and kindness. That's not the scripture. That's just me thinking out loud. Now, even when others do legitimately wrong you, forgive them. Do everything in your power to reconcile. Maybe they don't know that they hurt you. It could be the case a lot of times. And you need to go to them. Just make sure if you do, your motivation is love and restoration and not simply to justify yourself. I know this is not the cultural norm for North Americans. But how many know that when something in our cultural mindset and way of doing things contradicts and disagrees with the Word of God, which one needs to give? I think the answer is very clear. The Bible does not, you know, the Bible stands. We give. We change. Culture changes. Amen? <laughs> so, reconciliation is so important to God that did you know He actually gave it to us as a ministry? He commissioned it to us as a ministry? In 2 Corinthians 5, 16-19, we read, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. I just want to stop on that for a second. Isn't that beautiful? We regard no one from a worldly point of view. I think that's so important. We need his, his point of view, his perspective. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Amen. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Come on, that is some good stuff. We are called by God to strive for peace. To do everything in our power to live in peace with everyone at all times. And we'll just throw in the caveat, of course, if you've been in our the house in this particular local church, you know that we stand upon the Word of God and we do not compromise truth for the sake of peace. So not at the cost of truth, but we do strive for peace. Be ready. Are you ready and willing to recognize when you've got it wrong and to go and make amends? When we've spoken too harshly with someone or offended someone by our unruliness, and to go make amends and quickly, as the verse talks about, leave your offering there. Go and make amends. Don't just keep on going through the Christian ritual and observance. Trudging through your life, ignoring that ritual never supersedes relationship. Jesus taught us that. People come first. God comes first, of course, but... Pastor Scott last weekend pointed out that we don't need to agree on everything in order to have peace on every single issue. That's actually impossible because we're all people. And I've heard it said where there's people, there's problems. So if you're looking for the perfect church, let me just break it to you now. You're never going to find it. So we don't have to see everything eye to eye, but we do, as followers of Christ, as born-again believers, need to be united about, around this, around Jesus and around His teachings. 
chief of which is to love God and love others. It really all boils down to that. Have we been loving like Jesus, who daily extends his mercy and forgiveness to us when we don't deserve it? I don't deserve it. Can anybody else? (laughs) I do not deserve it. But I receive it, but I don't deserve it. Are we extending that same kind of kindness? Or are we withholding it from people? Are we doing our best to redeem the time, as Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, that we have on earth? To make the most of the time. Time is short, and I don't know about you, but I want to make the most of it. And I know that I'll continue to make mistakes for the rest of my life, because I'm simply not perfect. And I'm cool with that. Is everybody cool with that? Is everybody okay with that? That I'm not perfect and also that you're not? <laughs> Let's uh, just make it sure we're good. The same page here. What I'd like to do now is a moment of prayer and reflection. We'll just take a couple minutes here. So if everybody can just bow their heads and close their eyes, just so there's no eyes looking around at what other people are doing, just lock yourself in, just you and Jesus in this moment. Yeah, we need each other, but right now you just need Jesus. Just lock eyes with him and repeat this prayer after me. Lord, have I wronged anyone who needs my sincere apology? Now let's just dwell on that for a moment, just quietly with the Lord. And really open yourself to let him reveal to you There's a name just floating out there that you need to grab a hold of. You need to quickly go and make amends with that person today, if possible. Or maybe you need to forgive them for something they did to you so that you can sincerely apologize and not expecting reciprocation. Time is too short to hold grudges. We need each other. So just open yourself to the Lord's leading for a moment here. Just let him speak to you. Thank you, Father. Show us, Lord, you're faithful, Lord. You're faithful. We want to love like you do, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let your love reign in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. We wait on you, God. Now, if anybody didn't come to mind, that's okay. Um, I just really encourage you in the coming days, coming weeks, the rest of your life, leave yourself open to the Lord's leading. In any way, you may have got it wrong. In any piece, it doesn't matter what the other person did. If you had took any part at all in wronging someone else, you need to go and just, I'm sorry, period. And you will be amazed at what God does in your life because of that. The second prayer, let's pray together. So just repeat after me. Lord, help me me. to be mindful of my words words. and actions toward others. others. Amen. 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 If we could all stand, uh, I'm just going to close the service by all of us reading a benediction over one another. 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Let's read this together. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.